statement to run on naturally to allow everybody who wished to ask a question to ask that question and to get an answer. That does mean that we're going to be very, very tight for time for the rest of the afternoon, um, so I hope you'll bear that in mind. So the next item of business is a debate on motion number 12769 in the name of Duncan McNeill on behalf of the Health and Support Committee on Health and Equalities. Members who wish to take part in the debate should press the request speak button now and I call on Duncan McNeill to speak to me with the motion. Mr McNeill, 10 minutes. Could we have Duncan McNeill's microphone? Mr McNeill's your card in. Order, please. Order. Duncan McNeill. I began, I began with a question, presiding officer, and it, it shouldn't have been, where the heck is my card? <laughs> but I'll return to that question. Um, and, 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 I, and I indeed also have a speech. But let's, let me ask this. Can a society be too tolerant? The starter for 10, is Scotland too tolerant? You and I, whatever the colour of our political rosette, whatever our habits, hobbies, outside of here, whatever we had for our breakfast, are we too tolerant? Tolerance is not a bad thing, it's a good thing mark of any civilization worth the name. But at what point does it lapse into complacency or dereliction, fatalism, the acceptance of the unacceptable? And I'm talking about the indifference of the suffering of others, what Nye Bevan would have called social blindness. NHS, NHS Health Scotland has produced a graphic. It takes us along a journey eastward along the Argyle Line from Jordan Hill to Brigton. I'll wave it about for your attention. With each stop of the train representing a drop in life expectancy, 1.7 years for men, 1.2 years for women. Some call this the Glasgow effect, but the effects of inequality can be felt in all corners of Scotland, across all social classes, for inequality diminishes us all. But then, of course, there are some more unequal than others. In William McIlvenny's 1975 novel Doherty, he wrote, everyone had failed in the same way, it was a penal colony for those who had committed poverty, a vice which was usually hereditary. Now, we know Harry Burns' name is going to come up here today, probably in other, other contributions, but uh, I'm going to feature uh, the, this afternoon. I want to be the first to make Burns' ear, ears burn. His and Michael Marmot's evidence to us on the committee was impassionate, and passionate and compelling. And some of the more, most powerful evidence we've heard in this parliament in 16 years. Our former chief medical officer was evangelical about the early years. He told the committee about his daughter's gap year teaching in Spain. Each morning, the five and six year olds queued up when the bell went and each would give her, the teacher, a kiss and a cuddle before going into class. Now, there was no apples exchanged hands here, but it's fair to say in that context, we don't always show our children such love and care. Perhaps we should. If we want the next generation to be compassionate, 
imaginative, resourceful, spirited, and happy. To be masters of their circumstances and not as servants. To be resilient when things don't go their way and purposeful when they do. You're not, you're not going to be able to fix this, Sir Harry told us, pointing his surgeon's finger. Sir Michael joined in, asking us what sort of society we thought we were running. A good question. For over 40 years, health inequalities has been driven by a growing disparity in income, power and wealth. Successive governments in Edinburgh and London, ours, yours, theirs, none of us have dealt with this successfully. The Institute of Health and Wellbeing outlined three key domains, employment, earnings and education. A hat trick of factors out with the Health and Sport and Committee remit. Hence this afternoon's debate and our desire as a committee to draw others into this discussion. We knew the topic would be difficult when we began to consider an inquiry in 2012. Sir Harry told us it was much more complex than you think. He said the story of health inequalities was bedev bedeviled by people who knew the answer. Well, we'll not add to that bedevilment. We don't have an answer, but we do have lots of questions. Why is it more, why is it more equal societies enjoy better health outcomes? How important is community and quality of housing? Are the latest teenage pregnancy figures a sign of progress? What emphasis should we give lifestyle drift or the inverse care law or proportionate universalism? When do our family stress levels become intolerable? Is a zero hours poorly paid, low skilled job better than no job at all? And where does the molecular biology of a hug come, come from in all of this. Don't panic, Presiding officer. We'll, we'll leave Sir Harry to explain that one to you. But Sir Michael told us a health service for the poor is a poor health service. The allocation of funds is important, but cash alone cannot resolve this, as Campbell Christie told us. Through good times and times of plenty and through austerity, we have not resolved these issues. We need the right policies in place and the leadership and the courage to see them through. Beyond a single term of government, beyond even the lifetime of this administration and the next one. Because in the words of the 2008 report, social injustice is killing on a grand scale. Some would say that's overblown overstated, but not according to the World Health Organization's Commission on Social Determinants in Health. Sir Michael chaired that commission and his stance certainly hasn't softened. It's a political choice, he told us, that the worst off should suffer more. Poverty wasn't down to people shirking. It's because, he said, in a stage whisper, people aren't paid enough. There are some hints of hope. Sir Harry enthused about the early years collaborative, the family nurse partnership, the positive parenting plan too. If a policy is shown to work to make the difference to people's lives, we, we should pursue it. If not, we move on. And if that sounds easy, well, you have obviously haven't been listening. Sir Michael cited the example of Sweden. But leadership at a local level has been encouraged. Targeted services could make a difference, but tackling health inequalities has to be a corporate issue at the heart of local and national government. He talked about breaking down barriers in Norway to the extent that the Minister of Foreign Affairs could declare, I am the Minister for Health. That principle is important. And with no slight to Shona Robertson, our new cabinet secretary, our previous cabinet secretary, the responsibility of this issue must and should extend to all of our cabinet colleagues. Each and every portfolio 
Presiding officers, our, our uh, was a lengthy inquiry. So what did the committee learn? We learned that inequality, of course, is complex and multifarious, but <coughs> far from inevitable. It's of common concern to everyone. I cannot conceive of a single committee in this place that it doesn't impact upon. And it's on, that, on this parliament-wide basis we want you to take part today. In a, re a recent Scottish Government debate on tackling inequalities, I said aspirations were fine, but first we must win the argument. So the, so the, the argument, so ably uh, articulated by Sir Harry and Sir Michael, and and many others, not of the knighted realm. Earlier this month, the actor, Michael Sheen, told us in David Day rally, we only say we've crossed the finish line when the last of us does, because no one is alone. And there is, no, and there is such a thing of society. And of course, it's not just love, lovies, popes, presidents, mm -hmm. economists, uh, and, and even trade unionists, uh, and, and I'll finish at this, a clarion vo a voice, a compassionate voice. It's more than 40 years since Jimmy Reid gave his rectorial address at the University of Glasgow, described by the New York Times as the greatest speech since the Gettysburg Address. And I've heard um, uh, Harry Burns, who was a medical student at the time, there at the time, no, not Gettysburg, but Glasgow. Mr um, McNeil, you must draw uh, to a close. Yeah, I'm finishing now, President Officer. I've heard Sir Harry Burns say that the comparison was rather over the top as it flattered Abe Lincoln. But the theme of alien and alienation rings true today, as does his belief in the spirit and values of common humanity. Jimmy Reid said, reject the insidious pressures in society that would blunt your critical faculties and all that is happening around you. This is not simply an economic matter. In essence, it's an ethical and moral question, which is why, presiding officer, I ask again, can a society be too tolerant? Can Scotland be too tolerant? Are we too tolerant? Thank you. Thank you. Before we move on, I must impress that we do have to stick to time, if possible, please. Fiona MacLeod, uh, seven minutes, please, Minister. Seven minutes. Okay. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer, and thank you, Duncan McNeill, for what such a stirring um, uh, opening to this debate. Um, I, I have to really welcome this innovative approach from the Health and Sport Committee and its unique format and challenge in asking the other committees to consider what they can bring to the work of reducing health inequalities and ensuring social justice. Scotland's health continues to improve and people are living longer and healthier lives. However, for too long, the benefits have not been shared fairly. Duncan McNeill showed us his um, railway map and it started in Jordan Hill. It usually starts in Bears Den in my constituency um, because I think they like the alliteration of Bears Den to uh, Bridgeton. And from my constituents' pers perspective, I absolutely get the, the health inequalities and the gap that we have. Because the health inequalities gap between in life and expectancy for a man born in Strathkeln and Bears Den, as opposed to born in Glasgow, is 7.7 .7 years. But it's not just between my leafy suburb of a constituency and the great city of Glasgow. Within my own constituency, between the areas of most affluence and those of least, the life expectancy gap for men is 6.5 years. So driven by social inequality, boys born in the 10% most deprived areas will die 12.5 years earlier than their counterparts in the most affluent areas. For girls, the difference is 8.5 years. And these people will also suffer more years in poor health, often with multiple health conditions. And I am immediately going to start quoting Sir Harry Burns, as did Duncan McNeill. Sir Harry Burns has made it absolutely clear to us and made, made it sure that we know that health inequalities are not inevitable, they are not irreversible, and there is nothing inherently unhealthy about the Scots. Now, Sir Harry Burns said that when he was the Chief Medical Officer, but I think the cross-cutting approach to tackling health inequalities is seen by the fact that Sir Harry went on to also chair the Standing Literacy Commission and he's now on the Council of Economic Advisers. 
So it's clear that these are complex problems involving complex solutions from the widest range of policy areas with a long-term approach. As a government, we are determined to make tackling health inequalities a focus across portfolio areas. As the First Minister stated at the launch of our economic strategy, Scotland is leading the way in putting the quest for greater equalities at the heart of not just our social strategy, but our economic strategy too. We recognised the need for this cross-portfolio work way back in 2007, when the Ministerial Task Force on Health Inequality had and maintained a cross-cutting group of eight ministers. It recognised the role the wider public sector and others continue to play with representatives from local authorities. Equally Well is jointly endorsed by COSLA, representatives from health, the third sector and academia. From the outset, our shared approach combined equally well with the early years framework and achieving our potential. These three social policy frameworks recognised that a child's start in life, cycles of poverty and poor ill health are all interlinked. The position they advocate continues to underpin our thoughts of pursuing early intervention, moving to prevention and breaking cycles of poor outcomes in people's lives. Since 2008, though, we have to recognise that the external environment changed, global recession and an austerity programme which have increased the risks of negative impacts being shared unequally across our population. Just last week, uh, the Minister for, P for Health Improvement and myself were at the launch of uh, Voluntary Health Scotland's Living in the Gap report, and it was shocking to hear someone there talking about our children growing up with a food bank diet. And that can be illustrated in the rise of the food banks. And so I think it's important that we recognise that the Scottish Government, the action we've taken with £104 million committed during 2015-16 to mitigate welfare reform. The committee report covers benefits, so logically we should all be demanding the power over benefits here to this Parliament. I welcome the Health, Health and Sport Committee's interest, particularly their present examination of health inequalities and the early years. And so I would like to take a few moments to give you some examples of the significant work that we're already doing in the early years. The Early Years Collaborative has a number of key change themes, a few of which I would like to mention. One, early support for pregnancy and beyond. We set a stretch aim of reducing stillbirths and infant mortality by 15% by 2015. We have already met that target and are working on how we can further stretch that stretch aim. Uh, we are investing 1.5 million um, to change health visitor education and to create 50 new health visitor posts this year. By 2018, we'll have invested 41.6 million over four years for additional health visitors to grow the workforce by 500 by 2018. I'd like to also talk about attachment, child development and support for learning and also one of our uh, key themes in early years collaborative which is addressing child poverty through income maximisation. There's a wealth of evidence that shows that the work that we do with our young people in attachment at the earliest years is so important. And we're looking at that through, as you all know, the 600 hours of uh, ch free childcare, which we hope to increase to 30 hours a week by the end of the next parliament. We know that that's good for the child, it's good for the parents, it's especially good for the mothers, and it's especially good for their employment opportunities, and therefore increasing and maximising their income. I did want to talk about Bookbug and Play Talk Read, you'll not be surprised, um, but I fear I may not have enough time. But just Harry Burns and, and Duncan McNeil's talk about the molecular biology of a hug. And we are seeing huge amounts of progress in attachment when parents are working with their children, reading to their children. Because think of that physical attachment, heads together, reading the book. But it's also got incredible biological um, research behind it and uh, how it helps children's language. So to conclude, presiding officer, I look forward to hearing from the committee conveners today. I'd like to reiterate that it's collaboration, cooperation and close working is needed if we are serious that our shared ambition is to close the health inequalities gap. Thank you. Many thanks, Minister. I now call on Jenny Mara. Five minutes, please. 
Presiding officer, can I start by uh, thanking the Health Committee for their um, long and tireless work on this extremely important uh, topic? And can I also thank my colleague Dun Duncan McNeill for one of the best speeches I think I've heard since being elected to this parliament. And um, I, fe I feel a bit inadequate following some of the, the questions that he um, has raised this afternoon because I think I was very struck by his very um, honest assessment that none of our governments of, of any hue have uh, really and properly been able to, to tackle health inequalities in our communities. And I know that every member of parliament across this chamber sees um, health inequalities in their constituencies and in their surgeries and in our everyday lives as we are going about our business. And indeed, there are many, many questions. Um, I think the, uh, the minister has just alluded to some of the initiatives her government has tried to take forward, which we very much much support and um, welcome, but the, the questions on uh, health inequality are complex, they are multifaceted as we know, and they also run to um, an analysis of um, our economy, presiding officer, um, availability of work, um, well-paid work, um, good wages, the state um, of, of housing, um, the strength of our communities and um, facilities in our communities such as community centres and uh, sports facilities. And, presiding officer, while um, I'm on that, I was very struck by uh, a conversation I had with a constituent uh, just last week who was telling me about um, facilities for, for young women's football. And I think it's particularly pertinent because we know um, that integral and fundamental to health inequalities in our community is uh, facilities for access to sport. And we know how important sport Sport is in keeping people healthy and giving um, especially our youngsters that um, um, the facility to exercise regularly and to keep um, that kind of habit for the rest of their lives. He was telling me um, that there are 1,200, and I know the Cabinet Secretary knows this, 1,200 girls in the Dundee area, which, in which we both live, um, who play uh, girls' football. But the team that he takes in Carnoustie actually have to travel all the way into Dundee at least 10 miles uh, to access an astroturf pitch to, to train on at night. And it's that kind of lack of facilities in our own communities um, and lack of access. And we know um, how this impacts deprived communities more than affluent communities to get that kind of access. That is one example, but only one presiding officer of many examples in how that can hold us back. Presiding officer, I'd also like to touch on uh, one of the findings from the committee's inquiries around the availability of primary care and community-based services. I think it was Lorna Kelly of Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board said um, that the money available for primary care and community-based services was limited. And I know that everyone engaged in health debates across, this, across the chamber will know how important this is. So I think I think if we are going to achieve our aims on uh, health inequalities, we know that the NHS is integral to this and integral it's the services that they provide. So our primary care teams must uh, be available to, to deliver for people on the ground. Presiding officer, earlier this week, Macmillan Cancer released figures showing that we are more than 10 years behind other countries uh, in Europe in cancer survival rates. And there is a clear link, as we all know, between cancer survival rates and poverty. And so we know that if we're to reduce health inequalities, we can help more people um, deal with their cancer and live longer. Presiding officer, we must make the case that it is in all of our interest to ensure those with poor health are given the support they need to lead better lives and improve their health. And we can see that these statistics from Macmillan Cancer, that whole 10 years behind other countries in Europe, show that we do have a long way to go. Presiding officer, um, I think the Health Committee's report, if nothing else, reminds us of the scale of the challenge that we all face across this chamber in closing the gap between 
people who have, have good health and those in poor health. But I'm optimistic that we are committed to this as a parliament in partnership and with other parliaments across these Ireland and armed with the wealth of knowledge that exists among all stakeholders who come to this parliament and lobby us and among the health experts that we can make serious inroads into this important area. But the services that our close. NHS do provide are integral to the solutions to this. Many thanks. And I now call on Nanette Millen. Five minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The scoping exercise carried out by the Health and Sport Committee with the intention of defining the terms of reference for a possible full-scale inquiry into health inequalities soon indicated that these are rooted in much wider social and other issues, many of which are out with the remit of the committee or indeed of the NHS, and that such an inquiry would be unlikely to reveal, reveal very much beyond what's already been found by many previous studies. So that's why we decided to proceed with some shorter in-depth investigations into specific areas, such as teenage pregnancy, which have a bearing on health inequalities, and to ask other parliamentary committees to consider where their work might be relevant to dealing with this serious blight on our society. As we've said, Scottish successive governments have wrestled with this, but we still have the situation where a boy born today in East Dunbartonshire can expect to live for 82 years, whilst a contemporary in the East End of Glasgow is likely to die up to two decades earlier. And what's more, the latter will probably spend a longer period of his life dealing with poor health. And this difference doesn't just exist between different local authority areas. It also occurs within councils, between their least and most deprived areas. As NHS Health Scotland has pointed out, even my, in my own city of Aberdeen, widely recognised as very prosperous, there's a six-year gap in life expectancy for men and a four-year gap for women between the affluent parts of the city and the areas of greater deprivation. It's now recognised that the best way to tackle health inequalities is upstream, to use the jargon, by intervening early in life, indeed even before birth, rather than taking measures downstream to deal with problems which have already developed. Former, oft quoted former Chief Medical Officer Sir Harry Burns, who is renowned for his work on health inequalities, emphasised to the committee the importance of early interventions, pointing out that children who experience adverse events early in life are far more likely to have mental health problems and are far less likely to succeed at school, creating a generational cycle of failure in a number of domains of living. And he concluded that unless we break this cycle by radically changing conditions of nurture, attachment and support for babies and their families, we'll not be as effective as we can be. This is where health visitors come in and why on this side of the chamber we were delighted when Alex Neal as health secretary decided to fund 500 more of them because we've always thought that primary care practice-based health visitors are in pole position to help families right through from pregnancy and early years into school age, by which time lifestyle patterns have been set. They're ideally situated to pick up early on problems of development and nurture so that these can be tackled before it's too late, and they can give support or enlist help for patients who are struggling to bring up a family in conditions of poverty, poor physical or mental health, and other factors like alcohol and drug addiction, which are often found within deprived and disadvantaged communities. However, whilst it's accepted that the health sector has a major role to play, this has to be in conjunction with other areas like education, housing, environment, work provision and income, clearly cutting across many of the areas within the remit of this parliament. If real progress is to be made, as the BMA says in its briefing, significant efforts will have to be made across a raft of policy areas out with health and by different agencies collaborating and working more effectively together. Many children born into deprived communities are in households where up to three generations of the family have no work experience. And key to that cycle being broken must be education so that future generations can learn the skills they'll need to become part of the workforce. It grieves me coming from Aberdeen where we face very significant skill shortages in an area with near full employment. That there are parts of Scotland with significant numbers of people who have no access to jobs, but who with appropriate education and training could achieve a successful life in well-paid employment in industries such as oil and gas, although I appreciate there are difficulties there just now, which I hope will be temporary, or other sectors like fish and food processing and hospitality, where Scottish people seem reluctant to become involved. Difficult though, life, though it may be, I'd like to see the Scottish Government exploring ways to try and link the areas of mass unemployment with areas where there's a labour shortage, 
because this could give, could give opportunities to people who've previously been written off with no real chance of earning a living and improving their lifestyles. And to me, it just seems so unfair that in this day and age, that's still happening. Presiding officer, much work is currently being done by third sector and other organisations, all important in the collaborative approach so necessary to overcome health inequalities. Organisations like the RCN and Voluntary Health Scotland have important examples of achievement at local community and personal level. And I'd just like briefly to mention Systema Scotland, whose big noise centres have been hugely successful in Raploch and Stirling, Govanhill and Glasgow, and work currently underway to establish one in Torrey in Aberdeen, helping through music making to develop personal and community confidence and hopefully with a knock-on effect on health. I hope, presiding officer, I hope I've given you a little insight into what the Health and Support Committee has been aiming for um, with the need for cooperation across all sectors of policy. If we are to eventually overcome health inequalities in Scotland, we all want it and I hope we can achieve it. Thank you very much. We have a slightly unusual debate this afternoon whereby most of the contributors will be the Parliament's conveners on behalf of their committees. Unfortunately, speeches of only four minutes, and I first of all call the Convener of Education and Culture, Stuart Maxwell, to be followed by John Pentland. Uh, yes, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I am speaking today as the Convener of the Education and Culture Committee. Our, com our committee is uh, acutely aware of how inequalities can affect people's performance and participation in school, college and indeed university. We are in the middle of a year-long piece of work to consider how the educational attainment gap in schools uh, could be closed. As members are aware from recent debates, many different approaches have been proposed to bring about change in our schools. However, there is a commendable unanimity in the view that more effort is needed to ensure disadvantaged pupils do much better. No one, no one is willing to accept the current stark divide in attainment as inevitable. The differences in outcomes for our most and least disadvantaged pupils, at least, least advantaged pupils, have been well aired recently, and members will be very familiar with some of the key statistics. Now, rather than simply restate these, I want to highlight some specific aspects of our ongoing work that will hopefully help to turn around these statistics. We have just held an evidence session on how the third and the private sectors can help to raise attainment, particularly for those pupils whose attainment is lowest. Next week, we will consider how parents and schools can best work together to raise attainment, particularly for those who perform least well. As members will have picked up, questions around inequality were built into our work from the outset. As a committee, we think this is the best means of ensuring such issues are given the prominence they deserve. We will also examine how the attainment levels of pupils with a hearing or visual impairment could be improved. There are significant inequalities in these pupils' outcomes, and we want to understand how they can be addressed. In theory, of course, with the right support, there is every reason to suggest that visually and hearing impaired pupils could do just as well as their peers. But up to now, that has not happened. This is not, of course, the first time that our committee has considered the corrosive impact of inequalities on the education system and children's life chances. Earlier this session, we held a major inquiry into the educational attainment of looked-after children in recognition that, comparatively speaking, this group's performance was particularly poor. That was especially the case for the, the group described as being looked after at home, whose results in school were the poorest of all. Members won't be remotely surprised to hear that looked-after children also tended to have poorer school attendance records and were less likely to go on to employment or further or higher education after leaving school. Not only that, but they went on to experience poorer health and lower life expectancy. That's the thing about unequal outcomes. They tend to come in a package. Mm -hmm. uh, Remit asked, in part, why more significant progress had not been made since devolution in improving the educational attainment of looked-after children. Now, that remit may have suggested a certain weariness, that some problems may be just too difficult to solve. And over the years, many committee inquiries will have run up against this same hard ground. Why, despite all the efforts, all the legislation and all the funding, are our schools or our hospitals or our criminal justice system not performing as well as we all want? Very often, the response that's received is that entrenched inequalities can be so deep that they act as a break on progress. While it's important to be realistic, we should never be defeatist. We spoke to many children and young people who had experienced care, and we were struck by the enormous potential and the ability that they showed. With the right support, the right investment, and, to hark back to Duncan McNeill's speech, on a human level, love. If we provide them with the love and care they deserve, then that damage can be undone, and those people, those pupils, those children, those young people can flourish. 
Of course, we are the Education and Culture Committee, and it would be remiss of me not to mention very briefly that we have also considered inequalities in the cultural side of our remit. However, it must be brief, because I must ask you to draw to a close. The two sides are not, of course, mutually exclusive. Members will be well aware of initiatives such as El Sistema, which has already been mentioned. Presenting officer, I welcome this debate, and I hope I have assured the Chamber that the Education and Culture Committee as, is as committed as anybody else in this Chamber to tackling the many inequalities that continue to bedevil our society. Many thanks. I now call on the convener of public petitions, John Pentland, to be followed by Jimmy D. Thank you, President Officer. And can I thank you for inviting me to speak as the convener of the Public Petitions Committee. Now, while not a policy committee as such, we do deal with policy issues that raise that people raise because they feel they have not been given the attention they deserve. In this respect, the Public Petitions Committee have been very successful helping to fulfil the Scottish Parliament's aim of engaging more effectively with the Scottish people. Many petitions received relate to health matters and inconsistent access to services and medicines. At the heart of the health inequalities, there are often wider inequalities. And I'm sure many members will recall the petition about access to insulin pumps highlighted the different policies adopted by health boards. The committee was effective and ensuring improved access and consistency. The petition about the treatment for rare or orphan diseases was referred to the Health and Sport Committee. On the back of this, the New Scottish New Medicine Fund was established, and the petition about the chronic pain resulted in the Scottish Government setting up a national service for sufferers. However, more recently we received two health-related petitions that raised more fundamental concerns about fairness. Jeff Adamson, on behalf of the Scottish Scotland Against Care Tax, told the committee how current community care, car care charging affects them and the inconsistencies between local authority areas which lead to inequality. Mr Adamson said, Community care is needed to eliminate discrimination, promote equality of opportunity and protect human rights. Without it, many disabled people cannot participate in society on an equal basis with others. We believe that charging breaches at least seven different rights in this way in which a fair and just society should treat disabled people and their carers by taxing them to live a normal life. As you will note, at the heart of the petition is a health inequality and one that the Public Petitions Committee agrees needs to be carefully considered. The second petition is by Amanda Capel, whose husband Frankie was diagnosed with dementia before his 60th birthday and then sadly passed away at the age of 65. Mrs Capel told the committee that dementia is no respecter of age, creed or colour or how much money you have. Frankie did not ask to be diagnosed with dementia but I find that he is discriminated against by having to pay for personal care because he is under 65. Free personal care and nursing care was introduced in Scotland in July 2002 for people over 65. We pay almost £350 per month for his personal care, which covers 45 minutes input each day. I would love to have been able to continue to carry out my husband's personal care, but his dementia has progressed to the point at which that is no longer possible. It should not matter whether someone is 55 or 75. The issues have been under discussion for some time now, and I'm sure the committee and petitioners would like to see some more rapid progress on such matters. So while not a policy committee, I'm sure members will agree that we have a major role to play in ensuring that where appropriate and with, and with foundation, health inequality issues can be dealt with and flagged up for action. So in conclusion, President Officer, I welcome this debate, and I hope it will make us think more carefully about how, as a parliament, we tackle health inequalities. Many thanks. I uh, now invite the Convener of Infrastructure and Capital Investment, Jimmy Day, to speak, who will be followed by Michael McMahon. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. 
Um, Duncan McNeill, in his eloquent opening speech, told us that inequality diminishes us all, and he was right to do so. So I'd like to commend him and the Health and Sport Committee for the valuable work they have undertaken in scrutinising health inequalities. As convener of the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee, I wish to talk about the areas within the remit of our committee where opportunities exist to address health inequalities through infrastructure improvements. Government support for sustainable and active travel is one area the committee keeps under close scrutiny. Numerous studies highlight the obvious health benefits associated with walking and cycling, contributing to a more active and healthier lifestyle. We should not forget the further health benefits that can arise from reducing the amount of cars on the road, reducing carbon emissions and improving the quality of air in our communities. The, communi the committee has heard from a range of stakeholders, including Cycling Scotland, Sustrans and the Lothian Cycle Campaign spokes about the need for further and sustained investment for active and sustainable travel and the need for all communities to have access to the appropriate infrastructure required, such as dedicated cycle paths and good public transport links. Given the levels of health inequality that exist in our more deprived communities, it highlights the importance of doing all we can to improve the infrastructure to support active travel and ensure that all can benefit from the associated improvements to health and well-being through regular physical activity. We therefore ask the Scottish Government to re-evaluate the level of investment for sustainable and active travel. And I therefore welcome the announcement in February by John Swinney, the Deputy First Minister and Cabinet Secretary for Finance, of an additional um, £3.9 million for cycling and walking infrastructure coming to Scotland through the Barnet formula. And I very much welcome the announcement yesterday by Derek Mackay, the Minister for Transport and the Islands, of a £10 million boost for walking and cycling from the Future Transport Fund. So I'm glad that the, the Government is listening to the Committee. There is much more still to be done, but this is a good start to the financial year and will, as John Lauder, National Director of Sustrans, has said, build on the solid momentum that has been gathering pace over the past three years to create conditions for people to walk and cycle for their short everyday trips. We also asked the Scottish Government to consider how it could benefit from the success of a number of trial projects, such as those through the provision of enhanced cycling infrastructure in Edinburgh and Glasgow, as well as projects delivered through Smarter Choices, Smarter Places initiatives, as well as projects underway here in Edinburgh to make city roads safer for cycling and walking. Housing is another area in which improvements in quality standards can have a significant positive effect on the health and well-being of its tenants and householders. Everyone should have access to a home appropriate to their needs, provided with modern facilities, energy efficient and free from serious disrepair, in order to tackle health inequalities associated with poor quality housing. Such standards, particularly assisting with energy efficiency, can help alleviate fuel poverty and therefore free up family funds for essential purchases such as better quality food and help to maintain a healthy lifestyle and improve health outcomes. We therefore ask the Scottish Housing Regulator to keep the committee informed of social landlords' performance against Scottish housing quality standards. Where they fall short, we will ask serious questions about what action is being taken to improve matters. The provision of appropriate housing adaptations can also allow people to stay in their own homes and continue to lead independent, healthy, active lives rather than going into hospital or to a care environment. Far more serious health inequalities befall homeless people and the committee has monitored and will continue to monitor closely the implementation of the Homelessness Commitment 2012, which does appear to be delivering some tangible improvements. In conclusion, presiding officer, our committee welcomes and takes serious, seriously our responsibilities in seeking to identify policy and funding interventions within our remit which will contribute to a reduction in health inequalities and close the health inequality and life in expectancy gap which all of us in this parliament would wish to see. Many thanks. And I now invite the convener of welfare reform, Michael McMahon, to speak, who will be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. With so many conveners speaking, we each have understandably a limited period of time. So I'll therefore restrict myself to a single point. It's one that some may find uncomfortable, but it's one in which my committee has received consid considerable evidence and one which the majority share my view. Welfare reform is having a significant impact on health inequalities. Welfare reform is increasing health inequalities. Welfare reform is making people sick. Much of welfare reform affects people with disabilities. These people are all in the process of being reassessed. 
Some argue that this is so that they are not left to rot on benefits. Others argue that it is about saving the state money, as all these reassessments are resulting in fewer people qualifying for disability benefits. Either way, one thing that appears incontestable is that the process of these reassessments is making people sick. It is increasing the stress on already vulnerable people, making the sick sicker and increasing health inequalities. Welfare reform is making people sick. But don't take my word for it. Listen to ordinary people who have had the courage to share their experiences with the Welfare Reform Committee. Listen to Murray Grant from our bro who has MS and wrote to us last year. He said, yesterday I received a letter from Atos with a limited uh, capability for work questionnaire. I was a bit shocked when I received this as I thought I would not be reassessed until at least 2015. This could possibly affect my mobility, DLA and ESA payments. The strain and stress that going through all this again is, doing my health, uh, is not doing my health much good and I fear for my future. I am concerned about what effect this will have on my health as I have a degenerative condition that there is no cure for and stress does not help. Listen to John Lindsay from Kerfin in my own constituency. My depression can sometimes go away for periods of time, but it always comes back, and when it does, it hits me hard and floors me. I have always had a certain degree of anxiety, but since 2011, it has got worse to, due to the horrific experiences of job seekers' allowance and ESA. Now my anxiety is much worse than my depression. Or listen to Jane McGill from East Kilbride, who is on dialysis three days a week and awaiting a double organ transplant. I received a letter from the Department of Work and Pensions advising me they now consider me capable of work and I have been removed from the support group to the work-related activity group, which means I have to prepare for work. I had to go for an interview to the job centre last week, which takes a great deal of effort, not to mention stress, to get to. I am now expected to take part in their other activities, and if I do not, will, it will affect my benefit. The bottom line to this is I had a job with the government. They deemed me unfit for work, and I had to leave through ill health. I therefore claimed the benefits to which I am entitled, and now the UK government want me off those benefits and say that I am fit for work. I have copies of all of the relevant medical reports, all independent, which say I am unfit to work and will be for the remainder of my life. That is why I was retired through ill health from HMRC. The most people accept that some sort of reform of the welfare system was necessary, and that includes the assessment system. But it does not have to be this way. The transfer of responsibility for disability living allowance and personal independence payments to this Parliament gives us an opportunity to create a scheme that respects the dignity and humanity of those people with disabilities who will rely on us for support, an opportunity to stop welfare reform making people sick. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call on the convener of finance, Kenneth Gibson, who will be followed by Kevin Stewart. Thank you, presiding officer. And it is with pleasure that I speak on behalf of the finance committee. The health and sport committee concluded that most of the primary causes of health inequalities are rooted in wider social and income inequalities, such as low income and poverty, economic disadvantage, poor housing, low educational attainment and industrial decline. The Finance Committee considered a number of these issues and I will focus on our work on prevention and developing stronger scrutiny of outcomes. Preventative approaches were defined by the Government and COSLA as actions which prevent problems and ease future demand on services by intervening early, thereby delivering better outcomes and value for money. In 2011, the Government committed to a decisive shift towards prevention to bring about a step change in the way we fund and deliver public services. I announced funding of £500 million for three change funds to support a transition across public services away from dealing with the symptoms of disadvantage and inequality towards tackling their root causes. This would be achieved by leveraging funding from existing budgets to invest more in preventative approaches. The three change funds cover the early years, care for older people and reducing reoffending. Guidance on single outcome agreements states that SOAs should aim to promote early intervention and preventative approaches in reducing uh, outcome inequalities. In our scrutiny of draft budgets, the committee monitored progress in delivering this decisive shift. In evidence to the Finance Committee, Sir Harry Byrne spoke passionately of his belief in the importance of early years investment and the numerous benefits it could bring. 
However, we also heard other evidence from those responsible for delivery of frontline services about the problems that had arisen and maximise the impact of the Early Years Change Fund. To invest more in one area, one must disinvest in another, and the Committee remains concerned that we have seen little evidence of any budgetary shift towards prevention. Turning to reshaping care for older people, the Change Fund was introduced to improve the way that public, private and third sector organisations work in partnership to deliver health and social care services. This approach was intended to reduce unnecessary hospital admissions and increase the capacity of community-based care through social and health care integration and joint working. Once again, however, we heard of the challenges faced in disinvesting and the relatively slow pace of progress compared to the ambitions we have. Another important part of our scrutiny was on how we link financial inputs to the successful delivery of outcomes. We accept that showing links can be challenging given the cross-cutting nature of the spending in question. With seven of the 16 national outcomes in Scotland performs identified as contributing to a healthier Scotland, developing a, developing a better understanding and analysis of the information we have is vital to discovering what is, and as importantly, what is not working. The Government made clear that community planning partnerships would play a decisive role in the shift towards prevention. To do this, our public sector organisations must work effectively together. Again, the Committee heard evidence that whilst things are moving in the right direction, progress is slower than hoped. Indeed, one CPP told us they were now on the precipice of the next step. Clearly, there is a long way to go before we have truly joined up long-term planning aligned to prevention. Presiding officer, the topic of health inequalities is clearly a complex issue for which there is no panacea. However, it is encouraging that the cross-cutting nature of the problem has been recognised today and indeed in previous debates, and that so many committees are represented here this afternoon. Prevention is important in attempting to reduce health inequalities, and notwithstanding some of the issues I have outlined, the Finance Committee recognises that some progress has been made and supports the Government's approach to prevention. Thank you very much. And I now invite the Convener of Local Government and Regeneration, Kevin Stewart, to speak. And Kevin Stewart will be followed by Murta Fraser. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I, I welcome the opportunity to participate in today's debate uh, and uh, to contribute to the widener, widening discussion of health inequality issues. And I commend Duncan McNeill and the Health and Sport Committee for securing the time for this debate today. Um, the remit of the Local Government and Regeneration Committee uh, has afforded us a number of occasions to look at health inequality and, and inequality in general. And we've worked in recent times in reports into public service reform and regeneration where inequalities have been highlighted. But because of the short period of time we have today, I'd like to look at some of the current work that we've undertaken in regards to the Community Empowerment Bill uh, and the air weapons uh, and licensing legislation that we are currently dealing with. And if we look at, at, at community empowerment, uh, the bill itself is seeking to address inequality by empowering communities. Uh, a number of submissions and witnesses, however, have suggested to us that communities with sharp elbows would end up with a lion's share of what was available, with perhaps outcomes being improved for one community at the expense of another. Uh, many of our recommendations focused on building the capacity of those communities less able to take advantage of the provisions in the bill. Uh, we've recommended that public authorities should report on the measures that they have taken to address inequalities between communities in their area to underpin the shift in focus to assist those with less capacity. Uh, the bill also places a duty on local authorities to provide a sufficient number of allotments to ensure that waiting lists are below a specified target. Uh, in response to our video on allotments, uh, we heard how allotment growing could con contribute to ment mental and physical well-being, with one allotment holder telling us, and I quote, my mental health has improved greatly. I've had my medication reduced three times this year and I'm nearly back to the licensed dose. I'm stronger and healthier than I have been in years. I'm eating well of fresh organic produce. I'm getting exercise. I'm making friends. Something that I haven't been to, able to do for a very long time, if ever. And I think in terms of our engagement uh, with people uh, in the course of that work, we have heard back from them their stories 
which often we wouldn't hear how these small things can make huge difference to people's lives. And I think that we should take cognizance of the level of engagement that there has been in this area. I'd also like to look at the Air Weapons and Licensing Bill very briefly, um, presiding officer, because the committee has scrutinized uh, widely alcohol licensing provision. Uh, and what we have found um, that uh, boards have not acted particularly well when it comes to overconsumption of al alcohol. And there seems to be uh, little communication between health boards, alcohol and drug partnerships, and the police two boards uh, to highlight exactly where these difficulties lie. Uh, just this week, we published our report recommending we see a clear role for health boards and alcohol and drug partnerships in providing evidence to licensing boards to assist them in reaching their determinations. We expect all health boards to be proactive in presenting and championing health inequalities to licensing boards. Uh, we have many uh, other recommendations in this regard. Uh, convener, uh, presiding officer, um, I think that Duncan McNeil can be assured uh, that the Local Government and Regeneration Committee will continue to look at all in inequalities uh, and will take into account health inequalities in all of the work that we do. Thank you. Many thanks. Um, now call on Murdo Fraser to be followed by Rob Gibson. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to contribute to this debate as Convener of the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee. And I, I welcome the debate and, and the innovative approach that has been uh, developed. I have another role because I am co-convener of the cross-party group on health inequalities. Before I talk about the, the work of the committee, I just want to highlight uh, this new report that Fiona MacLeod mentioned from uh, Voluntary Health Scotland called Living in the Gap. I hosted the uh, event in Parliament last week which launched this. And we heard at that event about the vital role the voluntary sector plays in tackling health inequalities. And we heard a number of examples from different parts of the country of different projects, voluntary uh, projects, which are absolutely vital uh, to helping those who are most vulnerable as a result of health inequalities. And Mr Hepburn was the minister there and addressed a number of the points that were being raised. And throughout this whole debate, not just this afternoon in the chamber, but as, as we take this uh, issue forward more generally, I hope we can bear in mind the vital role that the voluntary sector plays in helping us address uh, the issue. But I want to turn and look at the interrelationship between health inequalities and economic performance, which is a matter that comes under the scrutiny of the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee. I think if we all go back in our own uh, family trees, we probably don't have to go back terribly far before we discover what could be called poor circumstances. That's what Sir Harry Burns asked members of the Health and Sport Committee to, to do during their inquiry. And the point that the former Chief Medical Officer was making was that poverty need not condemn you to failure. Somewhere on that family tree, however many generations ago, you'll find the moment at which enterprise or education made a difference. Sir Michael Marmot, who is the expert, expert in health inequalities, put it another way when he said, poverty is not destiny. He chaired the Commission on Social Determinants in Health, a World Health Organization initiative. And the findings of its 2008 report set out the economic benefits of reducing health inequalities. Benefits in terms of productivity, tax revenues, welfare spending and health costs. And the OECD came to a similar conclusion. Its research, published last December, found that countries where inequality was decreasing were growing faster. And this is a view that has been taken up by the managing director of the International Monetary Fund, uh, Christine uh, Lagarde. She spoke in a conference in London last May on inclusive capitalism and made a similar point. Now, these conclusions are not universally accepted. Nothing ever is in the field of economics. But there is at least a lively debate uh, on this issue, on the link between inequality and economic performance. And that will no doubt uh, continue. I'd like to thank Duncan McNeill and his committee for the work they are doing on health inequalities. And it's absolutely right that, that should not just be a, a matter for the Health Support Committee, but a match, matter that all committees of parliament should be aware of. Two years ago, the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee undertook an inquiry into underemployment. And we have agreed to do a new piece of work, uh, which will look at uh, the progress that's been made there, and also taking a broader look at work 
wages and well-being. The Scottish Government has made fair work in tackling inequality central to its refreshed economic strategy. Now, aspirations are one thing, as Mr McNeill said in his speech, but I think we need to see some more detail than we've seen so far. And four minutes is far too short a time to address uh, many of the key points we need to talk about. It's too short to cover the statistics from that recent SPICE briefing on fuel poverty. It's too short to talk about the Glasgow Centre for Population Health research on the quality of employment and its impact on well-being. And it's too short to outline the work commissioned by the David Hume Institute on the effectiveness of policies intended to redistribute income and wealth more equally. So today, Any Deputy Presiding Officer, please. we only scratched the surface, but I hope this is an issue we can return to. It is of such importance. Thank you. Many thanks. Now call on Rob Gibson to be followed by Christine Graham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. Um, on behalf of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee, I'm delighted to take part in the health and equalities debate. It's hugely re relevant to many of the issues that to manifest themselves in a rural setting and fragile communities. Uh, there are four parts to what I wish to say briefly. Uh, climate change, uh, access to outdoors and Scotland's natural environment, life in rural areas and service delivery in rural areas. So fundamental to our life and future is being able to protect ourselves against rampant climate change. And this parliament's taken a united view that we have to tackle it seriously. So within that, there are equalities issues, without a doubt, where people have to be protected and that uh, poverty uh, is something which is created by things like flood risk uh, and the research which goes into trying to avoid that and the disruption to families that can occur as a result of floods in our communities is something which we have dealt with. Uh, the Climate Change Adaptation Programme of being able to get people uh, clued up as to how to deal with heat waves or the cardiovascular and the respiratory diseases that arise from those are things which need consideration and much more research. Now, access to outdoors and Scotland's natural environment is perhaps the good news story. But unfortunately, not enough of our people do get out of doors. They do not get into even the lands such as the Forestry Commission land, which is close to our estates in the edge of our cities, but we're trying to create a central woods uh, forest network, a means for people to use that for recreation. That's a part of our concerns. The Scottish Government should familiarise itself with further work uh, of organisations seeking to ensure the outdoors are accessible to all groups in society so that the disabled can also manage to get there. Uh, disabled adults use uh, the outdoors only 64% of them compared to 80% of non-disabled adults. The service delivery in rural settings is something which also has a huge uh, bearing on the uh, health inequalities. Presiding officer, one issue uh, we've done work on is broadband provision in rural areas which can impact on health issues by not making telehealth easily available to people in the most remote areas where broadband should have been installed first. But uh, during the budget, the committee highlighted concerns about rural areas in Scotland with little, poor or no broadband uh, uh, provision. And I think we've got to make sure that that is rectified. But living in a rural area can help, can damage your health in a lot of other ways. Living in temporary accommodation, like caravans because of seasonal lets, or no access to the ground to have a house or no access to land on which to build a house are all matters in the rural areas that have a huge bearing on life. And therefore, we wish to see many of these tackled. But life in rural areas can also be dangerous. Agriculture is the riskiest occupation by industry sector in terms of fatal injuries. And mental health issues are there too. But I would suggest that uh, issues like dyslexia, which have been debated recently in this parliament, are very prevalent amongst farmers and raise stress levels and therefore affect people's health. But in conclusion, I think we should have some watchwords that are important to us all. And I'd like to quote Nye Bevan in that respect, because he said in a capitalist society, 
Either poverty will use democracy to win the struggle against property, or property and fear of poverty will destroy democracy. That is as true in rural areas as in the uh, cities. We must, close, and therefore, please. we must make sure that a more explicit link uh, between the national performance framework and equalities issues are made in the government's programmes. Thank you. Thank you so much. I now call on Christine Graham to be followed by Margaret McCulloch. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak in this debate on behalf of the Justice Committee. Our committee has a strong track record for considering health inequalities and inequalities at large as part of our work. And there are a myriad of examples in our penal system, drugs, alcohol abuse and so on. We considered health inequalities during our 2013 work on transfer of prison healthcare from the SPS to the NHS. And by healthcare, I include mental health problems. And again, the prison population has a disproportionate number suffering from these. This led to a series of fact-finding visits to prisons. One key issue that came through during those visits was the problem that offenders had, gaining early access to a GP immediately upon release. Indeed, many simply didn't have a GP and so quickly lost the benefits of prison health care, and in particular, removing them from drug and alcohol addiction. Next week, the Chamber will debate the Prisoners' Control of Release Scotland Bill at Stage 1. That bill provides inter alia that the Scottish Prison Service will have greater flexibility to bring forward the date of release by up to two days. Why should that matter, you ask me? Well, this will allow them to improve through care to prisoners on release because if you release them on a Friday, everything's closed the housing department, the benefits system, and even GP practices. So they will now be able to access these on release because those are the very important hours simply when you come out of prison. This is a positive step. And I call on the prison service and the NHS to ensure that people released from prison are able to be registered with a GP in their home areas as quickly as possible. We also considered health inequalities during a one-off roundtable evidence session in August last year on the link between brain injury and the criminal justice system, which led to a brain injury and offending work stream being tasked by the government, looking at issues raised in our session and reporting in summer 2015, because often people with a brain injury, their behaviour may give rise to criminal prosecutions, and the link is not made. And of course, imprisonment itself uh, leads to health and other inequalities and indeed I think it's very apposite that we have families outside lots of families of prisoners represented because they are affected as well by someone in prison but to be frank much of the remainder of this session will be devoted as usual to scrutiny of bills as we carry out that scrutiny we do so well aware that the impact of justice reforms on other matters such as health inequalities and human rights for example, the health impact on individuals who are trafficked, I hope, will be addressed following that legislation, if the Parliament votes it, coming into force by identifying victims earlier and protecting them from the traffickers, who often are reasons why they don't say they are being trafficked. We might also have the Community Justice Bill, referred to as by the Bureau, and there'll be opportunities there to address inequalities in health. But of course, all legislation, to be frank, doesn't lend itself to looking at health inequalities. But when it does, the Justice Committee makes every effort to deal with it. But I think the last thing the Convener of the Health Committee would be is what tokenism from other committees. But when it is relevant, we certainly build it into our programmes. Thank you. Thank you. Now I call on Margaret McCulloch to be followed by Christina McKelvey. Thank you, President Officer. As Convener of the Equal Opportunities Committee, I welcome the debate today on this very important topic. The issue of health inequalities has been highlighted during the Committee's evidence taken in a variety of areas. Last year, we examined how the budget affected both older and younger people. Evidence pointed to the difficulties in tackling multiple illnesses. In this context, Professor Stuart Mercer, Professor of Primary Care Research at Glasgow University, raised concerns about enduring health inequalities, suggesting that those from deprived areas may, at the age of 50, have the same number of multiple illnesses as someone in one of the most affluent areas who is 70. The committee is currently taking forward an inquiry into age and social isolation. Whilst we're still taking evidence and have yet to reach our conclusions, 
A number of key themes have already been repeated in scoping sessions and evidence, and the issue of health has came to the forefront. We have heard of the impact of social isolation on the health and well-being of a range of people. Evidence received to date touches on the health aspects and the related equality issues of social isolation. The Chief Executive of the Food Train, Michelle McCrindle, has told us that research has found just over 10% of those over 65 are often or always lonely, and that figure rises to 50% for the over 80 age group. Research has also found that just over 10% of over 65s are at risk of malnourish malnourishment or are, mal or are mal malnourished. For the purpose of the research, this means a body mass index of less than 18.5. The Food Train believes it is not mere coincidence that the same number of older people are affected by mal malnutrition and loneliness. Michelle tells us that in their experience, the two are interlinked which also means they can be success successfully tackled together. The Food Train has pointed out that food and eating are hugely social activities and that, they are, and that they see tremendous improvements in older people when they are supported with food access. They eat more, eat better and find motivation for food again. When you add in additional socialising support, such as befriending, the opportunities for improving food intake increases even more. The feedback from older members using their services is that they eat more than they would have previously, enjoy food more and are feeling better physically and mentally as a result. We have heard of similar important projects that are essential to tackling the health problems associated with loneliness. For young people, we have heard of the crucial nature of early intervention and health considerations from a range of groups, including Home Start and the Scottish Commissioner for Children and Young People. The mental health of younger, pe younger people in vulnerable situations has been drawn to our attention both formally and informally. Polly McIntyre of the Scottish Commissioner for Children and Young People's Office told the committee in evidence of a recent example of a young person with severe mental health problems. She says some of the delays that rose in the course of accessing appropriate support for them led to their condition deteriorating significantly. Even a delay in providing a service can have a massive impact on that child or young person's wellbeing. If we do not put in support at an early stage for a young person in a situation like that, or if we don't pick up on an issue, it spirals out of control and we potentially end up with a much worse situation for that young person further down the line. Finally, presiding officer, I wish to highlight the work of the Equal Opportunities Committee in relation to the subject of female genital mutilation. This practice against women has a severe and enduring impact on both their physical and mental health and is one of the most greatest inequalities that the committee has encountered. The committee is monitoring the work being undertaken, by, close, please. Be, been undertaken by the Scottish Government and awaits the report of the short, short Life Working Group that will consider ways of tackling the practice in Scotland. This debate offers me the opportunity to highlight the need for health services, to work towards prevention and to respond to the ongoing emotional and physical difficulties faced by women who have undergone the practice. Thank you. President Thank you very also. much. I now call the final convener, Christina McKelvey, after which we move to the open debate, and that will be opened by Nigel Don. I hope last but not least, presiding officer, um, illness is neither an indulgence for which people have to pay, nor an, aff an offence for which they should be penalised, but a misfortune, the cost of which should be shared by the community. Another quote by that wise man, Nye Bevan. Presiding officer, it won't surprise you as convener of the European and External Relations Committee by saying that I will speak on some of the work carried out by the European Commission and the World Health Organisation on Health Inequalities. Often when I am speaking at events in my capacity as convener, I find myself responding to questions that are effectively asking, what has the EU ever done for us? So let me talk about some of the international work that they have done. So firstly, what has the EU ever done in relation to health inequalities? The European Union has been working on specific initiatives in relation to health inequalities for over a decade. 
In 2003, it published a report on the health status of the EU, narrowing the health gap in the EU. And in 2006, the Council attached such importance to the issue that it identified an overarching goal of reducing health inequalities across the EU. More recently, in 2009, in response to increasing unemployment and uncertainty arising from economic situation in the European Union, the European Commission published a communication entitled Solidarity in Health, Reducing Health Inequalities in the EU. The reason for this was the European Commission regarded, and I quote, the extent of health inequalities between people living in different parts of the EU and between socially advantaged and disadvantaged EU citizens as a challenge to the EU's commitment to solidarity, social and economic cohesion, human rights and equality of opportunity. So in 2009, when the European Commission published its communication on health inequalities, it acknowledged that while the average level of health in the EU had continued to improve in the EU over the decades, the gaps in health between people living in different parts of the EU and between the most disadvantaged and the sections of population remained substantial and in some cases had increased. This takes me to the second area that I would like to look at in relation to the EU, which is life expectancy and how average life expectancy in Scotland compares with average life expectancy in EU member states. In 2012, life expectancy at birth in the EU was 83.1 years for women and 77.5 years for men. In Scotland, based on the statistics um, by NHS Scotland today, the average female life expectancy was 80.8 years and the average male life expectancy was 76.6 years. If we were to conclude Scotland on a comparison table with the EU member states, it would therefore sit below the average in the company of Central and Eastern European countries that joined the EU after the fall of the Berlin Wall. So therefore, maybe we need to be looking at the work that the European Commission is doing in promoting best practice and policies to address health inequalities and examine what has worked in other EU member states which has been more successful in tackling health inequalities or which face similar challenges to Scotland. I will now turn briefly to the work of the World Health Organisation. Determinants that the World Health Organisation set up a Global Commission on Social Determinants of Health in 2008 and published a report entitled Closing the Gap in a Generation, Health Inequality Through Action on the Social Determinants of Health. In 2009, the World Health Assembly passed a resolution on reducing health inequalities and urging its member states to take action. Since then, there have been a series of initiatives ranging from discussion papers to the development of handbooks and from conferences to regional reports on progress. Again, there may be value in looking at the work done under the framework of the World Health Organisation to see what we can learn from it. Presiding officer, I think that we are agreeing here today that Scotland, to flourish as a nation, more effort needs to be directed at tackling health inequalities. And I think there are valuable lessons that we can learn both from near and far on what can work. So I will conclude by encouraging those working in the area to look at the European Commission and the World Health Organisation's work. Many thanks. I now call on Nigel Dawn to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Up to four minutes, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And I'd like to look at a completely different aspect of this multifaceted problem. But my starting point is paragraph 66 of the Health and Sport Committee's report, where Sir Harry Burns comments on the comparative analysis of Glasgow, Liverpool and Manchester. He said that the difference between these three cities was related to empathy and correctedness, connectedness. Pardon me. Part of the challenge, he said, was about not just pulling a set of policy levers, but creating a sense of community and compassion for people. I have absolutely no doubt that he is right, but when I saw the Glasgow, Liverpool and Manchester, my eyes uh, immediately, my mind went to some unpublished research, which I've seen a draft of, which indicates that there are actually dietary differences between those populations. Does diet matter is a question that you might reasonably ask. Well, well, I think we probably know that it does. How much might not be quite so obvious to the Chamber. So I'd like to quote from the Journal of Public Health, published in, on the 11th of May in 2011, the the paper is entitled The Economic Burden of Ill Health Due to Diet, Physical Inactivity, Smoking, Alcohol and Obesity in the UK, an update to 2006-07 NHS costs by Peter Scarborough and others. And if I may quote selectively uh, from the abstract, it says, estimates of the economic cost of risk factors for chronic diseases to the NHS provide evidence for prioritisation of resources for prevention and public health. 
In 2006-07, poor diet-related ill health cost the NHS in the UK £5.8 billion. The cost of physical inactivity was £0.9 billion, smoking £3.3 billion, alcohol £3.3 billion, overweight and obesity £5.1 billion. Conclusion. The estimates of the economic cost of risk factors for chronic disease presented here are based on recent financial data and are directly comparable. They suggest that poor diet is a behavioural risk factor that has the highest impact on the budget of the NHS, followed by alcohol consumption, smoking and physical inactivity. I'd also like to refer to a report actually published, I think, within the last month from the Public Health Nutrition Journal, Trends in Socioeconomic Inequalities in the Scottish Diet, 2001 to 2009, by Karen L. Barton and others. Again, selectively quoting from the abstract, presiding officer, daily consumption of fruit and vegetables, brown and wholemeal bread, breakfast cereals, oil-rich and white fish were lowest, and the consumption of total bread highest, in the most deprived compared with the least deprived households respectively for the period 2007-9. The conclusion is important. There was no evidence to suggest that the difference in targeted food and nutrition intakes between the least and most deprived has decreased compared with previous years. Now, we know the effects of these things. The depressing thing is, despite the best efforts of everybody involved, we haven't made much progress. The point that I would leave the chamber with is simply that diet-related illnesses are, in fact, hugely important and hugely expensive, and that's why I wanted to make sure that that aspect of our community's life was involved in this afternoon's debate. Thank you. And thank you. I now call on Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Dennis Robertson. The officer, Labour's first Scottish public health white paper in 1997 emphasised the primacy of social circumstances as a cause of health inequalities, as had the Black Report 17 years uh, previously. But it's fair to say that under both Labour and uh, SNP uh, in Scotland since then, there has been a bit of that lifestyle drift that uh, Duncan McNeill talked of, important though downstream lifestyle factors are. But I think it's really important to reaffirm the importance of upstream societal factors and upstream action in order to combat health inequalities. There's plenty of general evidence from Richard Wilkinson and others that creating a more equal society is absolutely fundamental for combating health uh, inequalities. And it seems that the majority of, uh, of, uh, of health inequalities researchers agree with that perspective. Uh, Catherine Smith, who is a brilliant uh, researcher and writer on health inequalities, uh, at uh, Edinburgh University, published an article uh, in the Journal of Public Health uh, on August the 30th last year, uh, which uh, described how she had contacted a very large number, I think up to 100 experts in health inequalities throughout the United Kingdom. And the top three actions that they uh, proposed to deal with this problem were, number one, a more progressive system of taxation, benefits, pensions and tax credits. Number two, minimum income for healthy living. Number three, early years expenditure progressively focused. And I think those last two words are very important because they echo the words progressive universalism, which were used by Michael Marmot when he gave evidence to the Health Committee. I think that is a really central concept for combating health inequalities, although I accept it's a classic uh, chameleonic idea that can mean uh, different things to different people and take different forms in different circumstances. Of course, Michael Marmot's other central uh, concept, which he also articulated to the Health Committee, was the idea of a health gradient based on his classic study of different grades uh, of the civil service in London. And I think it's very important that we think of the problem of health inequalities, not actually in terms of health gaps, which is the common way of articulating the problem, but in terms of a health uh, gradient. 
Now, I believe, and I'll describe in a moment, I hope, initiatives to help the most vulnerable and disadvantaged. But we, if we do that only, we'll simply shift the gradient at the bottom uh, in a flatter direction. So we need to have upstream population-based uh, initiatives that affect the whole gradient. And that, I think, has to be the context in which we take the specific actions focused on the most disadvantaged individuals and communities. And in the last minute, I want to emphasize uh, to, uh, two particular kinds of initiatives that I strongly support. Firstly, community development uh, initiatives that I've certainly been very well aware of in my constituency for decades. And if I can just instance, for example, the Pilton Community Health Project, and I wrote to the Cabinet Secretary for Education about an, 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 an issue there this week. But the, the kind of actions that they take in the community, uh, I believe, are very, very important. And there are many other similar projects, and Murdo Fraser uh, emphasizes the voluntary sector more generally. Let's uh, let's, let, let's support those in disadvantaged communities. But also, let's not forget the NHS. Uh, because there's the deep end work, of course, with GPs, but also I uh, initiated a debate uh, uh, on the 7th of January about nursing at the edge, which, which is about nurses uh, leading uh, action to help the most disadvantaged and vulnerable uh, individuals in society. And I think that kind of action by the health service, often in community settings rather than in hospitals and wards, is also something that we have to strongly support. So we have, of course, to take action in terms of the most disadvantaged, but unless we also deal with the upstream societal issues and create a more equal society, we will never solve the problem of health inequalities. Many thanks. I now call on Dennis Robertson to be followed by Richard Lyle. Hey, thank you very much indeed, Presiding Officer. Uh, can I firstly begin by commending Duncan McNeill for which I think was an excellent speech uh, to set the tone for this debate this afternoon. Uh, and in doing so, I think you know, all the conveners have taken on board um, their respective portfolios and seeing how they can sort of look towards the, inequality, the health inequalities that do exist. Presiding Officer, I want to maybe sort of just focus on a few of measures that have been taken and, and it really, I think, that, that do make a difference. For instance, free eye tests, I believe, actually makes a difference to the health inequalities. And the reason I say that is because it, it's a preventative measure that can prevent people um, from maybe trips and falls. It can enable people to actually get about their daily business, which beforehand they may not have. Because before the introduction of the, the, the free eye examination, a lot of people were very reluctant to go to an optician for the fear of the ongoing cost. But what free eye test actually does do, it actually it identifies, it identifies uh, cataracts at an early stage, it can identify other conditions such as glaucoma, diabetes, uh, macular degeneration. And the things that I'm mentioning there, presiding officer, do have an impact on the quality of life for those that acquire those conditions. It can prevent them, for, for instance, going out. It can prevent them from taking part. It can prevent them from making, say, a simple meal. So though I think the free eye test is one initiative that you know, we should continue to support and ensure that our community optometrists are aware of the work that they're doing, but also how they can actually signpost people that come in to see them to maybe third sector organisations or indeed to other agencies. And again, if they require the uh, ongoing support of the national health. The integration of the health and social care is probably the model that may, and I, and I stress may, presiding officer, uh, make the biggest impact on health inequalities. Because at the moment, part of the problem we have is we're addressing this in silos. And we can't do that because we need to take a holistic approach to the whole problem of health inequalities. And it affects all aspects of a person's life. Now, if I, if, uh, can I commend Stuart Maxwell, by the way, for introducing those in the early education years uh, with people with sensory impairments? Because for many years they have been disadvantaged because the materials have not been made available to uh, those children to attain uh, perhaps the level they could in the early years and the support uh, thereafter, presiding officer. And I know a lot of work has been done to try and level that playing field, but a lot more needs to be done. And especially, and especially for those, I think, who are deaf and hard of hearing, there is a great deal more to be done 
to try and resolve that inequality that does exist. Because later on, we do know that those who have a significant hearing loss, especially those who are deaf, sometimes after education, do not find themselves in employment, do not find themselves with the opportunities that exist for other people to get into a further education or the skills market. So therefore, they are instantly, instantly um, a, affected by the fact of a sensory impairment. You might wish to draw to a close, please. And, and again, with those with physical impairments, uh, physical disabilities as well, are constantly disadvantaged and live because of the housing situation, because of our environment. Those people are disadvantaged and we need to resolve those inequalities. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And thank you. I now call on Richard Lyle, after which we move to closing speeches. A very tight four minutes, Mr Lyle, please. Thank you, President Officer. Can I first of all compliment Duncan McNeill on one of the best speeches that I've ever heard him make in this chamber uh, today. Uh, health inequalities are often described as the clear and unjust differences in health which come to pass between groups in different situations in our society. The issue with health inequalities in tackling is one which would require a coordinated approach because they are caused primarily and fundamentally as a result of income inequalities and poverty. These factors have a profound effect on which group or groups have the best chances in life. An example of this could be for those living in an affluent area in a nice house and earn a good wage would be not only financially better off than those in less advantaged circumstances, but the figures show that they would be, have a better standard of health too. And that's a situation I'd like to explore further. It's the health inequalities here in Scotland that our people face based on areas that they live in. I read over the helpful briefing and the health inequalities publications by NHS Scotland, in particular the figures in relation to the average life expectancy in my own central Scotland region, which I have to say made for disappointing reading. In North Lancashire, the average life expectancy for men is 74.9 years and for women 79.2 years. Over in South Lanarkshire, the difference is even more stark, with an average life expectancy for men 76.4 years and for women 80.6 years. The difference between the 15% most deprived areas and the rest of the local authority for that authority is as much as 6.9 years for men and 3.9 years for women. Scotland wide, presiding officer, in 2011-12, the health life expectancy of those living in the 10% most deprived areas was 23.8 years lower for males and 22.6 years lower for females than those living in the 10th, the 10 least deprived areas. The question is, how do we tackle these inequalities? This SNP government, I would suggest, has been working hard, using the powers which this parliament has to tackle health inequalities through the abolition of prescription charges, truly making the NHS free at the point of need, along with, as already been said by Dennis Robertson, the provision of three free NHS eye examinations, as well as a free personal and nursing care, benefiting over 77,000 of Scotland's older people, not to mention that we are delivering free and healthy school meals for all children in primary one to three. This is in stark contrast to the UK government, who have a lot to be responsible for as their austerity agenda and drive towards further and further changes in the welfare system. Changes which will no, no doubt exacerbate poverty and as a consequence will have a greater negative impact on health inequalities. To conclude, President Officer, it is clear that with that action like support being offered to tackle health inequalities through the £40 million primary care development fund, this Scottish Government are committed to delivering not only our national health, our own, on our National Health Service, but on delivering real change to make our country a fairer and equal place for all Scots to live. Thank you. Thank you. Many thanks. Now move to closing speeches and I call on Jackson Carlow. Up to four minutes. Mr Carlow, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And for those of us who are serial contributors to these health debates, this afternoon has been something of a treat, given as it has been that we have had so many contributions from what I suppose one must regard as the glitterati of the Scottish <laughs> Parliamentary Establishment, the committee conveners. And I'd like to thank some of them for even staying to hear contributions other than their own. And in that regard, I would pay particular tribute to Michael McMahon, uh, to Rob Gibson, to Margaret McCulloch and Christina McKelvey, who sat through the whole of this afternoon's debate. But all of the contributions that we heard were interesting. 
I want to come back really much to the uh, opening speech from Duncan McNeill, with which I found myself in considerable agreement. This will probably be a cause of some considerable alarm to Mr McNeill that we might find we agree in far more than he imagines. But, you know, when I came into politics, people say, say to me, did you come in to end poverty? Did you come in to end war and save the world? Did you come in to eradicate inequality? And then they say, no, you're a Tory. You come in to uh, perpetuate all of these things. Um, but consequently not, because I have to say that health inequalities, I'm convinced are at the root of nearly all the inequality that then flows from uh, in society. And that insofar as we can deal with health inequality, we could unlock the problem, which I think bedevils so many people in society. And I'd like to advance the theory that one of the problems, coming back to Duncan McNeill's assertion that all of the political parties here represented have at time been in government and be responsible and charged with trying to deal with the issues that we're discussing, is that our adversarial political system itself is one of the obstacles to our fundamentally tackling the issues at its heart. It's not that adversarial politics does not have considerable successes to which it can point, as various parties in office at different times have secured significant advances in, so, in society. But when I look at the whole NHS debate that we have in here, and the recognition, I think, across the chamber, gradually that what is undermining our ability to move forward with an agenda that would create a sustainable national health service is our need as politicians to fall back on that adversarial approach because we live in a kind of political system in which votes are won by so doing and arguments are somehow buried, albeit we all recognise the far greater understanding there are in many of these issues between us. And it's probably true... Nigel, no, Extraordinary thankful. Thank you very much. I wonder if I might just briefly return to what I understood of the member's statement that he felt that health inequalities underlay most other inequalities. Could I just ask the member to reflect at some point on this seminal study which indicates that it is in fact financial inequalities which give rise to most other difficulties. I'm not expecting him to counter that right now, but I think that's the message of a large amount of research. Jackson Carnot. I will, of course, uh, reflect on that, but when I look at the train that was identified going along the track, can I say that I think we are going to see the biggest concentration of type 2 diabetes in the future, the biggest concentration of dementia in the future on exactly the same track that we have seen all the other inequalities related to health that we've discussed uh, in the future as well. Uh, so for me, uh, there is an opportunity in this Parliament, if politicians of all sides are committed to so doing, to find and map out a way which addresses the health service, which will lead, I think, to many of the health inequalities potentially being resolved. It's one of the reasons, as Nanette Milne said, we are so committed to Can an extension those, of health visiting. To answer Duncan McNeill's question, are we too tolerant? Yes, we're too tolerant of a loudmouth adversarial political approach which has done little to advance the sustainable NHS and I think undermines the collective will we have to tackle health inequalities. Many thanks. Now call on Dr Richard Simpson. Up to four minutes, please, Dr Simpson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I believe the report of the Health Committee introduced by our convener, Duncan McNeill, has been welcomed. And hearing from so many conveners has also been extremely important. Education, dealing with looked after children, infrastructure on cycling and housing, housing adaptations, petitions on the accessibility and eligibility to services, welfare benefits on the insensitivities of a desirable to change, desire to change the system, but done in a way which actually crushes far too many people. Finance, Community empowerment, uh, community empowerment on the therapeutic effects of gardening, which I particularly enjoyed, economy, energy and tourism on, on uh, underemployment, rural affairs on service delivery, access and climate change, justice on drugs, alcohol, and again, referring to families outside and the children of offenders, I think a very important issue. Equal opportunities on younger multiple morbidity uh, with deprivation, uh, uh, age and social uh, isolation, food access, and the European and external relations on the role of the EU um, and on human rights. In the diversity of our conveners' contributions, I think there was one unanimity, and that is inequalities are everyone's responsibility. 
and there is clearly in this parliament a general level of ambition to reduce inequalities but the problem is how do we do it the helpful infographics referred to by Fiona McLeod and others on the gap in life expectancy along that train journey that Jackson Carlo mentioned uh, and also the related years of good health with the differences between communities published by Health Scotland whilst striking doesn't even take into account the fact that even in the wealthiest communities there is poverty, early ill health and premature death. But the gap between the rich and power uh, rich and poor, between the empowered and those without power, has regrettably grown. Whilst under Labour, the OECD recognised that child and pensioner poverty substantially reduced between 2000 and 2007, but since then, uh, poverty has increased. We were reminded by the BMA briefing of the increase in poverty from 710,000 to 820,000 in Scotland, child poverty up by 19%. Many speakers referred to Professor Marmot and Harry Burns in the evidence they gave us, which was very powerful, and they suggested a focus on a number of issues. Giving every child the best start, and there are attempts being made to deal with that. Giving everyone the chance to maximize their capability, but more importantly, and this is from the early Marmot study, have control over their own lives. Create fair employment, and this is embodied in, in I, I think, what is our common values, that there should be a living wage, which uh, the Scottish Public Health Observatory said was the single most important change that should uh, be made. We believe that, of course, you should eliminate exploitative contracts and improve workers' rights. We believe that it should be underpinned by a fair welfare state that doesn't punish people through the bureaucracy of trying to achieve a, better, a perceived better system. Uh, we need to create, as Marmot said, healthy and sustainable communities and this means good housing, education, transport, environment, safe, healthy food, strengthening social connectedness, such as the system of big noise that Annette Milne referred to. But, but it, it does apply to all communities to tackle the gradient of health inequalities, not just those in the lowest decile. The, the timelines that uh, were illustrated in the Alliance briefing, I th thought, were important. But they, I think the most important development was the SNAP paper, which hasn't been referred to, the Scottish National um, uh, Programme, which talks about a human rights-based approach. And I think that that is actually something critical. Presiding officer, we've had a very short debate today. This really could have been the subject of a full week's theme debate. I agree with Murdo Fraser. We have merely scratched the surface. We must have a much fuller debate on this. So many important issues were raised, but we need to consider them collectively and in an integrated way in a much, much fuller debate. Thank many you. Many thanks. Now call on Jamie Hepburn, up to six minutes, please. Thank you very much, uh, President Robson. Can I begin by uh, paying a tribute to the Health and Sport Committee, both for the report and uh, also for securing uh, today's debate? And can I also commend Duncan McNeil for his very passionate opening a contribution. I think that helped set the uh, tone of the debate. Can I also uh, commend the approach that the Health and Sport Committee has taken to uh, today's debate, which is uh, a fairly uh, innovative uh, well, I think the involvement of the other committee members has undoubtedly uh, helped widen the scope of uh, today's debate, although I have to say I'm not quite ready to agree uh, with Jackson Carlow's depiction of them as the parliament's glitterati, but uh, I think nonetheless uh, the, the debate has definitely benefited uh, by uh, the involvement, as was mentioned uh, earlier, uh, by uh, both uh, Fiona McLeod and uh, Murdo Fraser. Uh, I recently took part in the uh, reception that Murdo Fraser uh, hosted for Voluntary Health uh, Scotland. And can I say in passing, I agree very much with the point that Murdo Fraser is making that the voluntary sector has a huge role to play in this uh, uh, challenge. But uh, their report, uh, Living in the Gap, the central message from that was health inequalities are everyone's uh, business. So on that uh, basis, it's very welcome that uh, so many of uh, this Parliament's committees have engaged in this uh, debate today, and uh, I'm sure that interest and involvement will extend uh, beyond uh, this uh, debate. Uh, very briefly, Dennis brief, Robertson. Very brief, Minister. Does the Minister also commend the work of the cross party groups within this Parliament? Ben. Of course, I, I commend uh, the work of uh, uh, the cross party groups in this uh, Parliament, uh, President Officer. Uh, before uh, I respond to as much of uh, the debate uh, as I can, I uh, want to add. Uh, my reflections on the, uh, the debate around uh, health inequalities and how the actions were taken now as the government are uh, hopefully contributing to reducing uh, the gap to improve the uh, health of uh, our people. We must 
uh, look to address the fundamental drivers of uh, health and, more importantly, uh, more widely, uh, rather social inequality at the root of the inequalities in health uh, that we face as a society, as Richard Lyle said, is the issue of inequality of income. And of course, the committee uh, came to this conclusion. Well, I very much agree with that uh, perspective. And I think it is underlined by the fact, has been, as has been mentioned, that payment of the living wage has recently been found to be one of the most effective interventions to tackle inequalities, health inequalities. This uh, government has uh, taken measures to pay at least the minimum wage to all employees of the government and the NHS and has, of course, commissioned uh, the Poverty Alliance to promote the living wage in the private sector. I was very delighted to see that yesterday uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Fair Work, Skills and Training marked the 150th accredited living wage employer in Scotland. I was even more delighted, uh, President Officer, if you can indulge me, it was CMS Enviro Sy Systems, uh, who are based in Cumbernauld and Mowen uh, constituents. They are the 150th accredited uh, employer. Uh, last day, November's programme for government it also uh, announced their intention to appoint uh, an independent advisor on poverty and inequality to directly advise the First Minister on uh, actions needed to tackle poverty in Scotland. Uh, this accompanied a uh, provision of £104 million pounds in 2015-16 to mitigate the welfare benefit reforms being taken forward by Westminster. We also committed to establishing the Fair Work Convention to develop, promote and sustain a fair employment framework for Scotland. We are taking action to increase educational attainment and widening access to higher education, all measures designed to reduce inequalities and make Scotland uh, a fairer uh, place. Let me uh, respond to some of the uh, issues that were raised over the course of uh, the debate, President Officer. Uh, Jenny Mara uh, mentioned facilities uh, uh, for access to sports. She cited an example of girls' football team from Carnoustie that has to travel to Dundee uh, due to a lack of local facilities. Let me certainly agree that we should be trying to have as wide an array of local facilities as we can, and work is uh, underway uh, all the time to that end. But I thought it was an interesting example, though, because she actually picked up on an example where there is a group already engaged in uh, physical activity. And the big challenge in relation to this uh, area actually relates uh, to those not engaged in uh, physical activity. And we know that the uh, gap in uh, physical activity rates correlates very closely to socio-economic uh, circumstances. So it is a health uh, inequality issue. There has been some significant progress made through the Active Schools uh, programme and, of course, through uh, the uh, uptake of physical education. But I do believe, I want to go further, uh, I believe sport can make a bigger difference to tackling inequalities and improving outcomes. Uh, sport for development uh, uh, in Scotland uh, is a, a concept that is about trying to intentionally deliver uh, social impacts for individuals and communities through uh, sporting uh, activity. During uh, Legacy Week, I was very happy to visit uh, Active East in Deniston, which is delivered by Scottish Sports Future, very much engaged in this uh, concept, delivering good outcomes for the uh, youngsters uh, they are uh, working with. And I believe that we can use uh, sport to make a positive difference in tackling uh, Scotland's health inequalities. And that will be much of the work I take forward as uh, Minister with Responsibility for Sport. Michael McMahon, uh, the convener of the uh, Welfare Com Form, uh, Committee, and of course I have to uh, respond to his remarks as a former uh, deputy convener to that committee. I, I agree very much with the uh, perspective he set out that the UK government's welfare reforms are negatively impacting on people and are exacerbating uh, health inequalities. Of course, uh, this government, where we have uh, responsibility, is uh, investing to support vulnerable uh, people. Our current and planned uh, funding will result in an investment of around £296 million over the period 2013-14 to 2015-16. Uh, of course, uh, if only we could do more. Uh, President Officer, I see I'm running out of time, as is always the case in uh, these debates. Uh, let me say uh, to uh, the committee, I will uh, be responding in fuller and writing to them uh, uh, in to relation to their report. And I'll try and pick up on other uh, aspects that I've not been able to pick up in relation to uh, today's uh, debate. But I very much uh, welcome uh, the tender of uh, today's debate. I think it shows that this is a shared commitment. I look forward to uh, working with the Health and Sport Committee, every committee of this parliament, every member of this parliament, to do what we can to tackle Scotland's health inequalities. President Officer. Many thanks. And I now call on Bob Doris to wind up the debate on behalf of the Health and Sport Committee. Mr Doris, you have until five o'clock. Okay, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Can, in summing up, can I pay tribute, as everyone else has done, to our committee convener, uh, Duncan McNeill, for uh, the tone he set in the opening. And I think the work of the Health and Sport Committee has been maybe the best kept secret in this Parliament over the years and some of the sterling work we've done, getting on with it, the job at hand, irrespective of uh, party politics and finding solutions and finding ways forward. I hope the convener agrees with that. If, if we see 
health inequality is simply a matter for the health committee. The health minister, the health team and the NHS will never fully tackle the issue. That is why the Health and Sport Committee has sought this innovative debate format where we can, we can hear from all the conveners of the various committees. And on behalf of the Health and Sport Committee, can our committee thank you for all your time and your efforts, but also to say to you we see this as a starting point, not an end point, and that this official report should not just gather dust on a, on a shelf somewhere. I would like to uh, try my best to cover as many of the points raised within the debate. I thought Fiona MacLeod, on behalf of the government, set out fairly clearly some of the, the, the policy commitments that there is in terms of uh, tackling the poor start that young people have in life, the cycles of poverty and deprivation that persist, and income equality, inequality as well, looking at the upstream causes of health inequalities as well as what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis to try and, and mitigate. I think Malcolm Chisholm made that point very strongly as well during his contribution. I do note that uh, uh, the, the Minister made a bid for more levers of power in this place in order to tackle that. And of course, my views it will be the committee views, not my own personal views. But I would point out that at section 34, the committee makes significant play of the level of pay in society patterns of work and in zero hours contracts. We also talk about welfare reform and I quote, moreover, the implementation of welfare reform is reducing the income available to the poorest and most vulnerable individuals and families, potentially further impacting on health and wellbeing inequality. So we concluded that also within our report. I think irrespective of where the levers of power are within uh, politics and society, uh, presiding officer, this Parliament has to scrutinise all the policy decisions that are taken that could impact on health inequalities, and that's a commitment I think we all have to give. Jenny Mara spoke, uh, made an interesting speech talking about uh, primary care teams in part in relation to the funding that community and primary care receives. I, I'd maybe put on record that the Health Committee met earlier on today with the Nor Northern Ireland Health and Care Committee who were looking at ways in which you withdraw from the acute sector and moving more into primary care. And one of the things they're actually looking at is less targets in terms of things like elective surgery to disinvest from certain areas. So there's challenges across Parliament if that's the road that we decide to go down. Nanette Millen uh, spoke uh, passionately about the role of health visitors, and I know that's something she feels very powerful about and the work that this government's done in relation to that. Um, and we then we went on to look at uh, the various contributions made from our uh, our conveners uh, here this afternoon. Stuart Maxwell, on behalf of the Education Committee, said that educational inequalities was corrosive and speak powerfully in relation to the plight of looked-after children in terms of the poor health they have within society and their life expectancy. Uh, and I know there's a variety of what the Scottish Government has done, and our committee has also looked at kinship care in the past in terms of looked after children. John Petland, on behalf of Public Petitions, I thought gave an excellent example of how the existence of the committee itself, the Public Petitions Committee, empowered society, whether it was victories in insulin pumps or, as our health committee knows about, access to medicines for rare uh, and, and ultra-orphan uh, conditions. Uh, Jim Eady, on behalf of the Infrastructure Committee, spoke about a variety of things, but he spoke about sustainable and active travel, and I listened very carefully to that. One, one thing that I do know about sustainable and active travel, that can also be uh, subject to what we were calling in another context an inverse care law, and that is providing more active travel can get fit people even more fitter and healthier and active and doesn't always reach the parts we have to reach. But uh, I think it's important that Jim Eady put his, his work in that area for the committee on the record. Uh, Kenny Gibson, in relation to the Finance Committee, uh, chimed with myself and I think our committee in relation to the use of change funds uh, uh, and whether it's uh, younger people or for o o older, older people. Um, and the issues we have in relation to make sure those change funds do actually stimulate the structural change that is required in terms of mainstreaming successful pilot projects and disinvesting from things that don't give best value for money. Uh, Myrtle Fraser, on behalf of the Economy Committee, spoke about the benefits of the growing economy. And I'll look with interest at uh, the work they're going to do in relation to the theme of work, wages and well-being. Christine Graham, on behalf of the, the Justice Committee, spoke passionately about the need to get better through care for prisoners and release from prison. Margaret McCulloch, uh, on behalf of the Equalities Committee, spoke about the social isolation and loneliness and how that can impact on health and well-being also. Christina McKelvey gave an international perspective in relation 
to uh, the matter. Nigel Dawn spoke about looking at best practice within the UK as well. Uh, given the time constraints, I was determined to name check quite deliberately every single person that, that spoke in this debate because the point we're trying to make is that it is about a cross-party, cross-committee, cross-government approach. I think I do have to single out a couple of contributions in relation to uh, Michael McMahon and welfare reform. You just can't ignore the impact that welfare reform is having on society and the health of society when you're looking at health inequalities debate. And he spoke about the transfer of powers also. And Kevin Stewart, who spoke about community empowerment quite passionately. I think, quite frankly, that's what it comes down to. Yes, it comes down to the income that we have uh, in society, how that income is shared out, our peer our power relationships within society, and we heard about the idea of progressive universalism as well, but actually it is for me all about relationships. It's the relationships that we all have, our individuals, our families and our communities in relation to eco the economy and the wealth within the economy. It's the relationships with each other in communities and fostering positive and nurturing relationships, and it's relationships in this parliament to make sure that no longer, when we are tackling health inequalities, it's not the health committee's job, it's a whole government, whole parliament responsibility, and this must just be the starting point to actually tackle the, the persistent inequalities that have plagued our society for far too long. Thank you, Mr Doris. That concludes the debate on health inequalities. The next item of business is consideration of a parliamentary bureau motion. I'd ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 12818 on approval of an SSI. Moved. Question this motion will be put decision time to which we now come. There are two questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that motion number 12769 in the name of Duncan McNeill on health inequalities be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 12818 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on approval of an SSI, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to, and that concludes decision time, and I now close this meeting.